Hey everyone, in this video we're going to look at limiting reactant and percent yield. This is a subset of stoichiometry and it's the idea that when you mix two things together, one of them will determine how much product that you'll get. The metaphor we chemistry teachers love to give for this is making sandwiches. You're making sandwiches for a group of people and suddenly you run out of bread. Well, it doesn't matter how much meat and cheese and other toppings that you have. If you're out of bread, then that reaction ends or your ability to produce sandwiches is over. Actually, a sandwich sounds really good right now. One second. I was going to hit the spot. So we're going to go through a couple examples of limiting reactant and percent yield, and I'll try not to talk with my mouth full. Here's our first problem. Urea is a common fertilizer. Also, it's in your pee, made by reacting ammonia with carbon dioxide. Also, why are we talking about pee when I'm trying to eat this sandwich? Anyway, a chemist combines 592.7 grams of ammonia, and there's our molar mass, with 994.3 grams of carbon dioxide, molar mass of that, and produces 898.4 grams of urea, and there's its molar mass. I love when they give us the molar mass in the problem. The AP chemistry test usually gives you the molar mass. That's because they don't want you to spend time trying to add up each atom's uh, molar mass and combine them all. They assume that you know how to do that. They're just going to give you the molar mass usually. If we didn't have it, we'd look it up in the periodic table, or in this case, Google it. Um, determining the limiting reactant, theoret theoretical yield of urea, and percent yield for the reaction. So here's how I set up these problems. Whenever I've got two reactants and I don't know which one's limiting, in other words, I don't know which one I'm going to run out of first. Am I going to run out of ammonia first? And if so, as soon as that ammonia is gone, this reaction is done. It's not going to go anymore. Or am I going to run out of carbon dioxide first? If As soon as that carbon dioxide is used up, this reaction can't, can't occur anymore. I don't know which one I'm going to run out of first based on these amounts. And I've got these coefficients here and different molar masses. I can't really figure that out in my head. I don't know what's my limiting and what's my excess. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do two problems and then pick the lower answer. So I'm going to choose ammonia first. It doesn't matter the order. That's just first in my reaction. I'm going to figure out if ammonia were the limiting reactant, how much urea would be produced? Mm, P. All right. Um, so let's start out with ammonia. Um, we've got 592.7 grams of ammonia. Got that right there. Um, I'm going to use the molar mass to convert to moles of ammonia. And as I'm doing this, in a previous video, we went through the stoichiometry map. If it's helpful to have that stoich map out, have that out. Um, I'm not going to use it in these problems, but it could be helpful um, if, if, if you need it. We've got two moles of ammonia per every one mole of urea. I get those from the coefficients. And then I need to convert to grams of urea. And I'll use the molar mass of urea from the problem, 60.06 .06 grams of urea per mole of urea. My units are going to cancel out there, and I'll be left with grams of urea. And I calculated we have 1,045.1 grams of urea. Now, whenever you're doing a stoic problem like this, it's important that you at least go to one of the products to determine the limiting reactant. We didn't have to actually go all the way to grams of urea. We could have stopped at moles of urea. We could have even done moles of water. The main thing that, that's important for this, so maybe I shouldn't record this while I'm eating, um, is to determine one of the products. If you stick over here, you might not actually determine the correct limiting reactant because, because of these coefficients. So what I would suggest is always go to one of your products. Now, I went all the way to grams of urea in this case. And the reason for that is that's what I want to know at the end, right? The theoretical yield of urea. I, I want to know the grams of urea. And so um, I convert it all the way to grams. I think that's a little bit quicker just to do that both times. So let's do the next one, carbon dioxide. 994.3 grams of carbon dioxide. We get that from the problem right here. I'll use its molar mass, 44.01, to convert to moles of carbon dioxide. Grams are going to cancel out. I've got one mole of carbon dioxide for one mole of urea. And then I'll use a 60.06 .06 again to convert to grams of urea. All right, units are going to cancel out. And I've got 1,356.9 grams of urea. Now, I've got to compare these two answers now. 
which one should be my theoretical yield in this case? Well, if this were the limiting reactant, we would produce that. We've got enough NH3 to produce 1,045 grams of urea. We've got enough CO2 to produce more, 1,356.9 grams of urea. Now, if we've only got enough NH3 to produce this number of grams of urea, well, we're going to run out of that as soon as we hit that amount of urea, meaning that we will not get to produce this 1,356.9 grams, because at that point we would have run out of NH3. We're going to run out of NH3 as soon as we get to this number right here. Basically, whichever of these is lower, that'll tell you which is your limiting reactant. So NH3 is our limiting reactant here, and CO2 is our excess reactant. Now, sometimes the problem will just tell us that something's in excess, and then we only need to do it for the one that's limiting. But in this case, we didn't know, and so we had to figure out, okay, NH3 is our limiting reactant, which means that we don't need that 1,356 number. Um, that's not useful to us anymore. But we did need to know it because that could have been less than 1,045, so we still had to do both calculations. So our theoretical yield is 1,045 grams. I did four sig figs because that's the, um, all of our numbers here have four sig figs in them. You always do the least number of sig figs in the, the data that you used here um, is what you can keep. So I can't keep all five. I'm going to keep four here. All right. Next thing, let's go and determine the um, percent yield. Percent yield is easy. You just got to remember this. Percent yield is going to be your actual amount that you get in the lab when you do the experiment divided by the theoretical. Like what should you have gotten if, if it would have been 100% yield? Um, the theoretical is always what you do from the calculation. That's because it's a calculation. It's theoretical. It's not what you actually got in the lab. So that, that's our theoretical yield. And so we just take actual divided by the theoretical. Now our actual yield, if I look up here, it said it produces 898.4 grams of urea. That's what this chemist actually got when they did it. They didn't get the full 1,000. Does that mean they did something wrong? Well, not necessarily. There's different factors that affect what um, yield you're going to get in a reaction. And you'll find when we're actually in the lab doing reactions, we won't get 100% yield. We might get somewhere in the 90s, and that's awesome. We might get somewhere in the 80s or 70s, and then we might say, well, why is that? Why didn't we get as, as high of a yield as we might have thought? So I'm going to take the actual 898.4 grams, divide by 1,045, and I get this fraction, um, and we'll just multiply by 100 to change that into a percentage. And so our percent yield here is 85.97%. And that's how we do percent yield. I'm going to do one more problem, just so you can see another example. And so I can take a bite of my sandwich. Don't worry, I finished my sandwich now, so we should be good to go. Here's our second problem. In the lab, you pour 55 milliliters of 0.2 molar KCl in a beaker. To this, you add 1.52 grams of solid lead nitrate crystals, which are completely soluble in the water. So we have a beaker of potassium chloride solution. We drop in some solid lead nitrate. It dissolves, and then lead 2 chloride precipitate forms in the beaker. You filter out the new precipitate using a filter paper and funnel, then weigh it on the balance, which reads 1.135 grams. So we took that solution with the new precipitate, we poured it through a funnel that had filter paper on the top, the liquid went through, it trapped the solid in the top in that filter paper, we would dry that solid to make sure we get all the water out, and then we weighed it on the balance, and we got that 1.135 grams. Determining the limiting reactant, theoretical yield of lead chloride, and the percent yield for the reaction. Great. We're going to treat this just like the last problem. We know it's a limiting reactant problem because we have two reactants and we have amounts of each and we don't know which one is in excess. So I'm going to start with KCl first. And in the problem it says we've got 55 milliliters, so I'm right, 0 0.055 liters. Um, and we're going to use that molarity, as always, as a conversion factor from moles to liters. So I'll set that up, 0.2 moles of KCl per one liter times and then we're going to use moles to moles conversion. It's 2 to 1, it looks like. So 2 moles of potassium chloride for 1 mole of lead chloride on the top. So moles of potassium chloride cancel. And then we'll use our molar mass of lead chloride, which they give us in the problem, which is always great, 278.1 grams per mole to convert to grams of lead chloride. Units are going to all cancel out, and we're left with 1.530 grams of lead chloride. Now that could be our answer for theoretical, theoretical yield. We don't know yet though because we don't know whenever we do the same process for lead nitrate. Lead nitrate may only produce one gram of lead chloride in case 
Uh, in that case, that would be our limiting reactants. We've got to do both, even though this could be our answer. We don't know yet until we do both calculations. So let's do lead nitrate. And in this case, it gives us 1.52 grams of lead nitrate. We're going to use the molar mass of lead nitrate, 331.3 grams per mole. It's a 1 to 1 ratio to get to lead chloride for our moles. And then we use that 278 again. Units are going to cancel as always there. And then at the end, we're, we get 1.276 grams of lead chloride. All right. And it turns out that is less. So we're going to run out of lead nitrate reactant as soon as we produce 1.276 grams of lead chloride product. And so we won't get up to that 1.53 number. So if that's not useful to us, this lead nitrate is our limiting reactant. And therefore, 1.276 is our theoretical yield. Theoretically, that's how much we could get. And I'm going to round that to three sig figs um, because... We use 1.52 and that only has three sig figs and we have to, for our final answer, has to be the fewest number of sig figs we had in our starting answer, starting information. Now let's calculate our uh, percent yield. And again, that's always your actual yield divided by your theoretical yield. Our actual yield here was the 1.135 grams. That actual is always what you actually get in the lab. Whenever you do the experiment or whatever the problem tells you you got whenever you did the experiment, that's your actual. What you calculate, remember, it's a calculation is a theoretical thing. Theoretical is always going to be your calculated amount you should have gotten. So our actual is 1.135 grams divided by our theoretical of 1.28 grams. And that's going to give us 0 0.889, or we multiply by 100%, 88.9%, which is pretty good for a reaction in the lab if you're not being super, super um, precise and everything with what you're doing. All right. Hopefully that was helpful and you can go forth and do some limiting reactant and percent yield problems. Thanks for watching.